Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Green. I'm a physicist in the program here, and I'm uh, talking today as well as a co-chair, one of the co-chairs of our quality committee. Um, I forgot to make a disclosure sl slide, which is kind of important today, so I have to disclose I really have a love-hate relationship with incident reporting. I love it because it tells us a lot about our program, but I hate it because it takes so much time, and I think it diverts us from designing things proactively. So I'm sure you'll see that come through as I... Uh, Make my comments today. Pardon me? Where's the love part? Where's the love part? Uh, it'll come out. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like um, you got to scratch the surface a little bit as well. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about uh, a theory of how accident, or accidents arise that's relevant for what we do, a uh, description of organizations that don't have many accidents, that's HROs, and then this new systems theoretic model. That's about five years old that describes incidents. And then I want to get into what happens in our program, what happens when we report events locally, and then how we monitor our incident rates. So who was born in 1979? Not many people here. I mean, I was. I know Marco was. Some of the people in the front row, I'm sure were. Although they don't look it. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the year the Winnipeg Jets won the last AFCO Cup. Uh, Houndsfield and Cormac got the Nobel Prize for... Uh, CT scanner, there's a big train derailment in Mississauga. And on March 16th, this movie came out, and I remember seeing it that summer because I was with my, visiting my brother in Yellowknife, and it was great overacting by Jack Lemmon, as usual, in this movie about the China Syndrome. Uh, <coughs> curiously, the tagline for the movie says, only a handful of people know what it means. Soon you will know. Twelve days later, the Three Mile Island accident happened. Um, and that was a, one of the biggest nuclear accidents in U.S. history. Uh, and it gave rise to this so-called natural accident theory, and that's why I bring it up uh, this morning. So Three Mile Island is a very interesting nuclear accident. This is a typical American-style nuclear power plant. Um, and what happened uh, at about 4 in the morning, there was a water filter that was blocked. And the operators tried to clean it out by the usual things, blowing water back through it, and it didn't work. So the plant started exactly as it should, doing its emergency shutdown. Um, <clears throat> and the primary cooling system started up. And unbeknownst to the operators, a valve up the top here, this pressure overload release valve, got stuck open. So the operators back in the control room thought that valve was closed, but in fact, it remained open. The, it turns out they had closed down the secondary water system just for maintenance, and it took them 25 minutes to realize that they couldn't stabilize the plant because there wasn't any of the secondary cooling water system coming in, and that valve was closed. So eventually they got cooling water to come in, um, but the valve stayed stuck open. They couldn't figure out. They kept putting in cooling water, and the, valve, the reactor wouldn't cool down. So then they made a decision to reduce flow to this pressurizer, all because they had this metal model in their head that that valve was closed. And in the end, what happened was that the core overheated, and uh, the fuel rods melted, and the severe, there was a severe core meltdown. Now, the China Syndrome movie posited the idea that that core would get so hot, it would burn all the way through the earth to get to China. Hence the name of the movie, and uh, hence uh, Jack Lemmon's nonstop angst throughout the movie uh, at the operators of the reactor. He was railing against the man. Um, <clears throat> the good news is in that uh, accident is that the containment building worked, and there over a few days a hydrogen bubble developed, but it was contained, and there was a minimal release of radiation. So a guy at the time called uh, last name uh, Charles Perrow came up with a model for these kinds of accidents called natural accident theory. And Three Mile Island is a great example because it says there is a small local problem, a stuck valve. Um, there are incorrect metal models by the operators. The nuclear engineers all thought the valve was closed, but in fact, the control system said it was open. And this was coupled with uh, erroneous actions they made because of design flaws in the power plant. So all that led to reactor damage and a potential for off-site release of radi uh, radiation. And when you own a nuclear power plant, the last thing you want to do is release radiation off-site. So he came up with this, uh, sorry, not natural, normal accident theory, and he posits two terms that I think we want to keep in mind when we do radiation medicine, and that's complexity and coupling. And he points out in his theory in some technological systems, uh, and I think we could swap radiation medicine for nuclear power plants sometimes, uh, leads to unpredictable interactions and systems act, system interactions or accidents that are inevitable or normal. So the key points, as I said, were this, this idea of complexity and tight coupling. And what that means is that when you're operating in a complex, tightly coupled system, you don't have time and you don't have a depth of understanding to control incidents and avoid accidents. 
Uh, and in fact, if you try to do things like add redundancy or add more checks into the system, that can make things worse because you're actually are increasing complexity. So it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a very uh, pessimistic kind of theory about uh, how technological systems work. But I want to draw out these lessons about types of interactions and types, uh, types of coupling because when we look at incidents in our program, we have to keep those thoughts in mind. So I'll pay more attention to the complex side of the slide uh, and think again uh, about being on the treatment unit or getting a patient from decision to treat the first fraction and which of these elements do you find yourself on the left side that we have a linear system or on the right side that we have a complex system. So certainly down on the treatment unit, we're working very closely together with different technological systems, uh, different staff and patients. We have common mode connections, meaning we communicate uh, in a lot of shared ways with common software systems and even spoken language to a number of people. There's lots of subsystems. We don't substitute in and out. If, if uh, Pinnacle doesn't work, we don't go grab Pinnacle Mark II off the shelf and use it. We're constrained with what we use. Uh, we have lots of feedback loops in our system. Uh, the most important one probably being the one between the oncologist and the patient, the, oncologist, or then the patient and the treatment unit staff. Um, there's lots of multiple and interacting controls. And all this, Pero suggests, leads to limited understanding versus that simple linear model. Now, coupling is an interesting uh, uh, counterpart to this. Uh, and there's a great story of a dairy in the United States. It, it had a great distribution system. So good, in fact, that one morning, uh, milked all the cows, sent a sample of milk off to the lab to test it, delivered the milk to the customers just in time. The customers were able to open their fresh milk to realize they had contaminated the milk back at the factory. But their delivery system was very tightly coupled, and they were excellent at getting milk contaminated or not to the customer. So tight coupling can be risky at times. Uh, there's no delays. Sequences are, um, are sort of rote. They happen the same all the way. There's only one way to do the job. Uh, and ideally, so I think at occasion, uh, we work at, in a loosely coupled system, and, um, and, uh, and at other times it seems we have a tightly coupled system. So I think there's, there's more argument here about how we deliver radiation medicine in terms of coupling. So Para had these great ideas, and then he put them on a graph like this. And this is where the theory, I think, has, has um, met some uh, discrepancy. Because he said, oh, the worst quadrant you want to be in is complex, tightly coupled. So we don't want to have things, we don't want to work in the system that would include nuclear power plants, nuclear weapons, and flight. So those must be the most dangerous industries. But the sad reality is mining is way more dangerous than nuclear weapons. There's never been, in about 40 or 50 years, there hasn't been an accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon, but there's mining accidents all the time. So somehow, in his understanding of how these, uh, the interactions and coupling in these industries, they got labeled it wrong and put in the wrong quadrant. But as I said, er whoops, I said earlier, I, I would kind of argue that we tend to end up in this, certainly we're a complex system uh, and we're tightly coupled. And if we imagine in a few years doing it, trying to do adaptive radiotherapy in real time, I think we're definitely into the, going to be tightly coupled in a complex uh, system. So I mentioned those, that, uh, that quadrant of uh, complex, tightly coupled, being um, thought to be higher risk, but in fact they have good safety records. So let's look at a model, high reliability organizations, and we've all got a few emails about that from our new CEO in the last month. Those organizations are here, nuclear power plants, electrical distribution system, telecoms, a favorite uh, example is um, air or, um, aircraft carriers, and space flight. So what do they do? Well, they're reliable, and that means they satisfy requirements over time, but only under specific conditions. The catch is they know a lot of the conditions under which they operate. So they're very, uh, they have a sort of a great encyclopedia of their operating conditions. Interestingly, they want to be reliable. So their first goal is not to be safe. If you want to be safe, you eliminate hazards. If you want to be reliable, you eliminate, try to eliminate failures. Now, a side effect is that they're safe. So one, a simple example of that is say if you're a chemical engineer and you're de designing a reactor vessel and you make the easiest thing to do to make your reactor vessel safer, safer is to make it thicker. But should something go wrong and there's a pressure overload and it explodes, a thicker vessel will, will do way more damage in the explosion than a thinner one. So the vessel has become more reliable, but it's less safe. So it's, it's just because you're reliable does not mean you're safe. 
these HROs arrive in, uh, in these kinds of environments. And interestingly, there's not a great literature of hospitals in, uh, in HROs. They're usually in the other industries I highlighted earlier, but I think we could all imagine hospitals fitting into uh, this, this milieu. So their attributes are these five ones as, uh, in the classic paper uh, referenced at the bottom. They're preoccupied with failure. In the classic aircraft or, uh, um, airplane example, the aircraft carrier <laughs> is shutting down flight operations because a piece of paper blows across the flight deck. Um, so small violations are, are thought to cause harm uh, and potentially can produce catastrophic out outcomes. Think of that stuck valve in, the, in Three Mile Island. And those are all learning opportunities, so HROs are learning organizations. They're reluctant to simplify, uh, they, but they know these complex systems can be unpredictable and subtle, uh, and they have a deep understanding. They're very sensitive to their operations, so they have lots of uh, up-to-date data flowing all the time. And they see that complacency is a threat, not monitoring their operations is really not an option. Uh, they're committed to resilience, so that means even though they try to understand every possible failure, they always so they want to avoid errors in this classic error triangle. Uh, but when they get when they have errors, they never want to be in a situation where they they fail to rescue themselves. So if you're, for example, an oil tanker in the middle of a, of the Pacific Ocean, you have to be very self-sufficient. And if there's a failure there, nobody can come help you. So you have to be able able to uh, rescue your your own operations. And interestingly, there's a huge deference to expertise. So the decision, a lot of decisions are made by the frontline staff because those technical staff are, are seen to be the ones that have the greatest knowledge of operations. And there's a benefit when management lets those staff make those decisions. There's, there's a, a, a social capital is built up and there are good relationships. All those things add up to a term that I really like called mindfulness. And when we work in the quality committee, and particularly when we're analyzing incidents, we want to bring this idea of mindfulness, of being very cognizant of all aspects of our operations through these five elements. So it's interesting. So back in my hometown in uh, March this year, this airplane flopped on the runway. And so here's the question for you. Uh, all the natural accident theorists in the room, you guys would say, huh, I knew it was going to happen. Airplanes are complex, no matter what we try, they're going to fail, and we end up with airplanes on runways in the middle of Jan uh, March in Halifax. But if you're an HRO believer, you'd say, not to worry, this hardly ever happens, so HROs work. So do airplane crashes validate natural accident theory, or do they validate HRO theory? Everybody likes HRO. So you know, ac airplane accidents, except for in 2014, are pretty rare events. Um, so it is a, a much safer system. Yeah. Um, so HRO. So this is a challenge, and we try to bring UHN. And it's not an RMP thing. HRO is for the whole organization, not just a subset. Um, when we try to migrate some of those um, features from HROs to a hospital, what happens? Well, HROs have really been identified by their safety records. So I would argue that the safety systems on an aircraft carrier are not the same ones we have here, so they might not be transferable. Um, HROs really know a lot about uh, their technical operations. And one of the advantages they have is they keep those operations stable. And in medicine, I think there's been a lot of change in the last few years. I'll we'll show some slides about that, uh, particularly in radiation medicine. It's difficult to obtain that knowledge, but once you know it, uh, it, it is easy to design for reduced risks. And uh, this is an interesting one, uh, there's interesting tension around this. Despite that, there's awareness there can be unanticipated failures. So HROs are able to cope with uncertainty. So even though they spend an extraordinary amount of effort being mindful about operations, they still develop a capacity to react when things don't go as planned. So here's an example of a stable process. So I grew up in Halifax, I got to look at the Navy ships, and in fact, I have a very vague memory of going to get my father at the dockyard and seeing the only Canadian aircraft carrier at the time. So I don't know if that's true or not, or if I dreamed, because that would have been about when I was about four years old. But uh, the Bonaventure was, uh, was the Canadian aircraft carrier. Do but have one now? Hmm? Does have no, one? That, that was the last one. Which leaks, right? <laughs> yeah, there's four of them that leak, though, so it's not just one submarine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a little reliability. Interesting, one of the greatest reliability organizations in the world is the U.S. submarine program, and it's called SubSafe, and since they implemented it, they have not had a single fatality on a submarine. Uh, 
a really, really robust organization. And the second submarine, or third submarine, they commissioned under that. They rushed the commissioning. They didn't follow subsafe, subsafe and it sank. So they're, they're actually, uh, that, that's a really good example of submarines. So I looked at these photographs. So there's an aircraft carrier from 100 years ago. There's the aircraft carrier for next year. And I got to think, flat top airplanes, calm airplanes go, they go on the water. Not a whole lot of change. Um, stable technological process there. And then I look in our business. There's a tomography machine from 1925. And there's our, the Aquilian one we have downstairs in 2015. Um, so I don't think we can uh, just transfer that aircraft carrier model over because of the great rate of change of technology in our business. Leaders take on an interesting role in HROs. HROs, now sometimes it's easy to prioritize safety as a goal because if you're a firefighter or an air traffic uh, controller, that's your, your only goal is to be safe. In medicine, there are always competing goals. Uh, and interestingly, the aircraft carrier model does have a flaw. They might stop uh, flight operations when they're training because of a piece of paper blowing across the flight, flight deck. But in battle conditions, they're not going to do that. They cease to operate as HROs. So they're not as, perhaps not as HRO-ish as uh, the models would have you to believe. This is a, a very interesting example of how leaders can screw up in uh, an HRO. So in uh, NASA, they were putting a lot of pressure on their engineers to get the International Space Station flying, and they thought the best way to do that was to put a screensaver on every person's PC at their desk that counted down 961 days, 15 hours, 23 minutes, 34 seconds to the launch of the ISS. 33 seconds, 32 seconds. So there's a little bit of pressure when you're at work trying to be safe. And during that time period, uh, the Columbia shuttle went up on January 16th. That's what it looked like. And that's what it looked like two weeks later. So the pressure from leadership was thought to be a contributing factor in that accident to get the ISS uh, in the air. So it's easy to have, uh, easy to generate leadership conflicts in an HRO. So we talked about how accidents arrived in natural accident theory. We talked about the kind of organization that maybe we want to be. Uh, and this is a great model from Nancy Levison at MIT about uh, not just how organizations are structured, but how you can investigate accidents. This has come up for a couple of years at the, comp at the Canadian Winter School on quality and safety in radiotherapy. So I thought I'd buy the book. Um, it's a great book by Nancy Levison. Marco Carloni, as usual, is like five years ahead of me. He got the book when it first came out. And he's uh, some of the slides you may recognize from Marco's rounds in about 2012, if your memory goes back that far, which is not nearly as far as 1979 when we started the talk. Um, <clears throat> so she points out that safety is an emergent system property. And I like that phrase because that's really <coughs> from the Canadian Patient Safety Dictionary. Uh, safety is an emergent system property. It's not the sum of individual parts that work and indivi individual interactions between parts. And uh, so we work uh, in the integrated socio-technical system uh, in radiation medicine where we combine technology, organizations, and individual persons together. So this kind of model is really well suited to the kind of work we do. And in fact, I'll give a plug for my friend Todd Palicki who's coming to the quality course next week because he's developed some expertise and does in fact collaborate, collaborate with uh, Professor Levison in this domain. Uh, <clears throat> so the nice thing about STAMP is it does provide a way to model and analyze and design systems. If you read about HROs, you just learn about this description of systems and then you have to figure out on your own how to become one. But the STAMP model allows you to change your organization uh, to become one. So um, this is the first uh, idea of systems theory in engineering is that systems are hierarchical. So there's many, many levels and we can extend this up. And I thought about my, my poor daughter who was um, lugging around newspapers yesterday. She gets about, about three quarters of a cent per newspaper. And the poor, she's skinny as a rake. She's 13 years old and she carries around like 50 kilograms of newspapers and makes about three bucks for her hour, hour of work. But she knows about hierarchical systems. Because if she, as a newspaper carrier, doesn't get, the, uh, doesn't get any newspapers, and that happens in Mississauga, she doesn't call the owner, she calls the delivery manager. The delivery manager is responsible upstream to the office manager. So we're all familiar with these kinds of hierarchical systems, and in STAMP it just gets formalized a little bit more. This is a great engineering model of how, well, really how the whole world works, certainly how the technological world works. And we can think about it again, referring back to Three Mile, Island, Three Mile Island. The plant operators there were controllers, and they had a model in their head about how the nuclear plant worked. And ideally, they would exert some control actions, and that process would respond. And then they have monitors, and they feed back uh, information to the, uh, the guys that hold the process models. In that case, 
the nuclear power plant engineers. Now, let's transfer this model to what we do. What if you're on a treatment unit, and as a therapist, you're the controller, and you have control actions about moving around the patient, for example, in, for IGRT. There's a controlled process where the coach moves, and that information is sent back. So we have these kinds of systems all throughout our industry. Problems arise when there's a mismatch with the state of the process. So if that feedback is incorrect, or if the controller sends, uh, sends wrong control and actions. So let's say the, uh, the feedback downstairs on 2B is to move two millimeters to the left, and somebody moves the couch two millimeters to the right. The wrong command is given. So this kind of model, I think, is well suited to what we do. And the last, second last element I want to talk about in the Levison model is this idea that there's a, um, she posits that all technological systems naturally migrate to hazardous states. So if you don't have adequate enforcement of safety constraints, you end up with inadequate control, you have hazardous processes, and you end up in a hazardous system state. So we haven't, in the incidents I'll talk about in the next few slides, we haven't used this model to analyze them but it would be very easy to apply this kind of model to the, the incidents we see. It's very, uh, very, very uh, easy to do. So uh, with that, I'd like to propose uh, in the room here, we can even vote on it, but I really want to ban these kinds of simple models we have about talking about radiotherapy because they're, not, they're really not appropriate. Um, they can get us certainly a little bit far in understanding what we do, but because we have a hierarchical system with lots of feedback loops, the old Swiss cheese might tell us a few events uh, that happen, uh, but not everything. Uh, the linear causality model, usually not only one thing goes bad, uh, lots and lots of things go wrong when you have an incident. And my favorite part on the domino model here, and the print is very small, but the second box says um, this accident happened because of the fault of the, per of the person, carelessness. And uh, we wouldn't learn very much if we just looked at all our incidents in the quality committee and said, ah, carelessness. You can put that one aside. There we go again. However, if you want to see that in action, go to the ROSIS database in Europe, and you can read great accident descriptions like therapists uh, put the patient on the coach in the wrong spot. Again, why, will they keep, why do they keep doing that? That's their accident reporting in ROSIS in some cases. So how you report accidents, we'll talk about presently. That is not the way to do it. So we want to get to more sophisticated models uh, when you understand incidents. What we've learned in looking at a lot of the incidents in the last year or so on the quality committee is the importance of mental models. And three models, are in any technological system, there's always three models. They're, they're what, the, what the designer wanted to do. And I would I think everybody in here at time has a role as a system designer. We think, how we're, how, especially in, in the physics group, how are we going to implement pinnacle? How are we going to do brachytherapy? We come up with a model and uh, <clears throat> we try to move that forward. But we deal with... You know, things, have, things aren't implemented yet. We're dealing with averages or uh, um, uh, not, certainly not a constructed system. So we make some specification, and then we actually build something in collaboration, really, with the rest of the program, with the IT guys, with our industrial partners. Uh, but it's not quite what we, minded, but we meant, but it's close enough. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing MRGRT. This really uh, is a bit too close to the bone for me, because that's uh, still lying out there. But we get an actual system that is not what we uh, uh, wanted. And even once we get that actual system, it evolves and changes over time. Once you're working in the real system, then you learn from it and you get some operational experience if the operator, and you get some advice from the designer. I always make the point, I spend some time on uh, CT, you know, the, uh, the app specialists from our industrial partners who are very learned people never have to deal with patients in their regular job. So the operational experience, procedures and training they bring is quite different from the operational experience that we get uh, when you actually do work with patients, which is the best part of our job. And so operators continually test their model against reality. So when you look at incidents now, I'm very mindful of the fact that what the operator is doing is probably not what I thought the system was supposed to do, and some of the truth is probably somewhere in between. And that's a difficult mindset, at least for me it was a difficult mindset to, uh, to learn about in the last few years. So enough about um, theory, let's get on with what happens when you report an event. And I hope everybody here has reported an event sometime. Because I, well, I, well, I always brag when I go to other places and we talk about incident reporting, I say we do a good job at reporting events with our incident reporting system. Um, in fact, we all report so many events that Lyndon, who's the first guy that sees them, Lyndon Morley, and I'm usually the second or third guy in Mike Velocevic, and the Quality Committee, we cannot keep up with all the incidents. 
So that's good reporting, and that's, that, that is said to be one of the most difficult <coughs> steps to achieve in incident reporting, is to get a high reporting rate. So I'm hoping that this page is familiar to everybody when they go to an incident report, and if I go down and I can pretend click on incident reports, and I get to this page, and as a physicist, having seen an incident, I would pick, click on that panel, and I see this, and I get a big box to write a text part of the event, a text description, description of the event, and that is the most important information. If you're reporting an incident, a nice clear description of everything you saw is very helpful. There's all this other stuff up here which is kind of okay. I mean, that helps uh, those little bits of information, helps us locate it, but the textual uh, description of the event is very, very valuable. So then we start to think, the incident comes in, we start to put it in these bins uh, that the, uh, we follow the rules that were set out by the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. So we have unsafe acts, so things that have gone wrong with our patients, and then they fall into these three categories. Fortunately, we never ever have to deal with the rightmost one. And I think of that like uh, maybe on the drive to the train this morning. Um, if I wanted to run over my neighbor's trash can, that's sabotage. That's uh, sabotage. I didn't want to do that. Um, however, um, I got to the end of my street, um, and you know the light had changed yellow, but my train was coming, so I broke the rule on purpose. And I rationalized that I broke the rule for a good reason. We do that all the time in our program. We make the city, we have policies, but we violate them intentionally or unintentionally. So we, on the quality committee, deal with um, uh, violations, and we deal with errors. If I went around the corner and uh, I was looking at the dog on the neighbor's lawn and didn't see an oncoming car because I was distracted, that's a, an error. Can I, can I yeah. ask, so the violation here is deliberate. Yeah. So as you say, it's like, for example, we cut corners because we're running out of time. Yeah. So would you consider that to be a violation? That's a violation. Yeah. If there's a policy in place that there are a procedure that says how we ought to do stuff and we cut corners. Um, and I haven't thought about it this way, but I wonder if all workarounds are essentially violations. And um, it's in healthcare, the workaround is, is our nemesis. And man, we got tons of them here, but we got there's tons of them in every hospital. Um, but those would be a kind of violation as well. That's probably the most common, because we usually, I don't think we, we never say, uh, uh, it's even hard to think of a really outrageous example, like I know this, I know I'm supposed to CT the patient's chest, but I might as well do their, their abdomen while they're here. We don't do stuff like that. That would actually tend more towards sabotage almost. <laughs> Maybe just don't do that stuff. Um, so once you, so errors are, are, we can subdivide down even further, uh, and the slips, lapses, and mistakes, um, and so I just, uh, uh, my wife and I joke, we only, we don't talk very often, but we do have blackberries, so, <laughs> apparently there's a few other families like that, uh, in so I, I think of uh, errors just in terms of my blackberry, so um, there's a slip, which is I, I dialed the wrong number, which really doesn't work anymore because you know, all the numbers are on the phone. Uh, there are lapses is uh, I just completely forgot to call you. And then uh, mistakes, you know, you, I know you told me to call you on your cell, but I called your office. I did call you, right? So I, had a, I, I picked a good plan to do. It was just the wrong plan to execute at the time. So when we see errors coming through on the quality committee, we'll use words like, we'll use the term slips, laps, and mistakes. And then a very interesting one called the latent condition. So that's a problem that's sitting around and we don't know it's there. And that's the case that, you know, the battery in my phone died. So that's a problem. It actually becomes a, um, it changes its nature um, when we actually go to use the phone, then we're aware of it. But when we're, the battery in your phone is dead and you don't know, that's a latent condition or a puddle of water on the floor that you haven't mopped up or, or uh, put, put barriers around. So, so imagine you've seen that, you've been part of an incident or a near miss, uh, and so you want to report that event or hazard. So you fill out the report, the process leader is notified, and then he puts it in, uh, Lyndon is the process leader, he puts it into one of three bins. Lyndon is overworked, we need about four of them, because um, there's, there's just so much stuff to do. And this, he, the first step he takes, though, is to categorize these as major or severe incidents, and I don't know that we've ever had one, at least not when I've been hanging around the quality group, uh, and then minor no pack incidents or near misses and hazards. And then the radiation oncologist uh, is notified as appropriate, and then it gets fanned out to a, the physics team lead for comment. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things can happen at this step. We can do a comprehensive investigation, uh, and that's a term, again, from the Canadian Patient Safety uh, Institute, or, uh, and that's... Um, 
um, uh, for, well, known as a Quincy around here, um, but comprehensive is a, in, a incident analysis is a, a better term. Uh, it's multidisciplinary and it can take days to week. These are big investigations. The ones I've been involved with, I figured things out when I've been on the train three weeks later. Like they're they're tough uh, and they involve a lot of people. Uh, the last one I saw, I think the final report was about 50 pages. These are, are tough things to, to go through. Um, any of those events can end up uh, with a comprehensive report and the smaller ones can end up with this concise report concise report, and that can mean Lyndon doesn't even have to get up from his desk to do his work, or he might have to walk around and talk to people and get some advice um, for these concise reports. So I'll go through how we do uh, the concise reports, and but first the comprehensive one, the so-called Quincy. We decided a few years ago uh, to use the London Protocol, which is a pretty reasonable way to analyze incidents um, from Imperial College, and it's a nice seven-step program. <clears throat> um, so you get your group of people together, or you identify the incident, get people together, <clears throat> and then they go and start doing the hard work of organizing themselves and gathering the data. They figure out the chronology, and the chronology can be quite detailed, and there's actually uh, there's, there's a, quite a skill set uh, of being able to figure out a chronology, quite a skill to be able to interview people as well, and there's lots of re-interviews uh, involved. And then they identify this neat idea that our care delivery problems, maybe two or three or four uh, big issues that went wrong that caused the incident, and then contributory factors that caused those care delivery problems. So for three or four contributing, uh, for three or four care delivery problems, there might be 50 contributory factors that the, the group identifies. And the last step is the real difficult part, and it's a completely different skill set that you need uh, upstream of that, is making recommendations and developing an action plan. <clears throat> and that's where the quality committee now is, um, that's I think what we want to focus on in the coming year, because that is really, really difficult to make sure when we learn stuff, we actually implement it. This is a um, reasons model for how organizations generate accidents or incidents, <clears throat> and it's easiest to understand starting on the right side. So some incident happens, that's because it's got through, so we have lots of safety barriers around here. So that's a little bit of the Swiss cheese model, um, which is still valid in that small case. <clears throat> but those arise because of the care delivery problems and all these contributory factors have, um, have uh, produced the care delivery problems. So here where we get that hierarchical thing that we had in the stamp model, I think is that the management decisions and organizational processes really, um, while they do contribute to the contributory factors, they support and create the contributory factors in the organization. So this is a very this is the model upon which the London Protocol for Investigation is based. The contributory factors are actually the funnest part, funnest part to go through. Uh, you really have to have a good imagination. So I've, these are sample ones straight from the London Protocol, but I've highlighted in uh, in blue the ones that we see most commonly uh, in our. Uh, so yeah, you know, if a patient's sick and really needs to get treated quickly, uh, that can uh, be a contributing factor. We have a lot of technology that helps us make decisions about the patients um, and uh, the quality of those, the information they uh, send us and the reliability of those subsystems um, affects errors. Uh, how we work as a team uh, is very important and how we, uh, that team does handovers in particular it can be a, a common contributory factor in our work. Um, our safety culture and our priorities of the program also, in a very subtle and deep way, influence uh, how we make errors. And I think we're largely buffeted, um, although the chief might disagree with me on the last one, but certainly as a, just a, a working physicist, you know, I don't often think about what the government's going to do on the health care budget this year when I come to think about the patient in front of me. But that's, yeah, that's, that's your job. That's the, that's the good thing about a hierarchy. <laughs> So I'm not going to go through any of these incidents because just, I could take each one could be described in an hour or longer. But the, the things that you've heard of, if you've taken the quality course or you've seen at the Monday lunchtime rounds here, are the type of pretty big incidents, you know, laterality. It, uh, there's a, a list of now it's up to 27 things that should never happen in a hospital. Number one is wrong-sided surgery, a list from the NHS. And so we take laterality incidents pretty seriously. So a bracky laterality incident would got a Quincy report. Um, uh, a funny CTV in the planning system. Our brachy source got contaminated. So that wasn't really a problem for the patient, but that really screwed up our infrastructure for a while. So that had a big uh, contextual reason for getting a Quincy. So these are the kinds of things, and near misses as well. This was, that was the first Quincy I ever did. 
um, back when they were called Quincy's, um, and or we called them Quincy's, um, about a near miss uh, for a pair of spinal case. So those are the big things. Unfortunately, you only have one or two of those a year. The small things are way more interesting, and there's a greater learning opportunity there. And so this is a real one, and this is a sort of a medium-sized one. It's kind of beefy. So um, very kindly, the, the reporting staff here. So this is this is what was in the um, e-booking uh, incident report. So the radiation oncologist very kindly reported this that it happened sometime last year at 12 noon, and um, there's a problem with a prescription. It was found out at check film rounds. So wrong fraction size. Right? Uh, but delivered for four fractions and then corrected. So it gets sent to the physicist. The physicist was uh, uh, mute on this one. Um, that never happens when I get an incident report. Um, the clinical significance was minor. Um, so comments by the practice leader. And this is where Lyndon and his, some of his colleagues, uh, the process leaders, um, put in a lot of work. So um, this, and if we think back to some of the terms we saw before, oh, so here's a chronology a bit like in the London Protocol. And somewhere on this page is the word slip. So after all the analysis and talking to people and seeing how this arose, the idea was, well, there are two prescriptions to choose from and there wasn't much difference. So uh, then you have to think about how could we avoid that? Uh, this actually, uh, the recommendation down here is really about the timeliness of site group review. Um, so that's the kind of thing uh, that we get well, I won't tell you how many of those we get. I'll ask you to guess before I show the correct answer on a few slides. And so that, that was a pretty big, concise report. That would have taken a few days and a few interviews to figure out. This is the one that I see most, uh, we see most often. A uh, patient didn't show for her CT appointment. Uh, and those are, there's not much to investigate there. Um, it happens a fair bit. We don't know why. So what we've done, and you know, the same format is... This is a good one for physicists to make no comment on. <laughs> or, um, we don't get to deal with patient appointments. But when we see a, a few of these, what we do now is what the Canadian Patient Safety Institute calls a multiple incident analysis. So if we see a few commonalities, then we have to uh, strike a group to try to understand what's going on for those, those a number of small things that have a common feature. So what, what's the trigger for that? Like 10 over a year? Or, you know? uh, that's, uh, you know... Uh, so the last, the last comprehensive report we had, um, so I was sitting in the airport and I emailed Lyndon and I said, yes, uh, this uh, incident we had, it's, it's, we should investigate this. I guess I said that to him at work. And then the next day, there's a couple emails and I said, well, geez, who decided we were going to do a comprehensive investigation? And Lyndon said, well, you did. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the same way, I, I don't know, yeah. So I think that we do... So, Unauthorized authority. That's not one of the categories. Here. <laughs> Actually, when it comes to, with me, it would just be a multiple thing. Um, so I think the issue there is um, it's probably discussed at the quality, well, it is discussed at the quality committee, and I don't think there's a threshold, and it will probably be a combination of frequency and importance. Mm -hmm. And I think with a lot of these things, I'm starting to understand it's good that we don't have hard rules, um, like we don't need six things of severity two or something, or minor severity. Um, so I think the quality committee decides that. And, you know, all the quality committee minutes are on the, our Wikipedia, so you can always look to see what the quality committee is up to. So depending on the type of investigation that happens, the big ones go to steering, and the small ones go, this is really interesting, so a number of people in the room are on this, we're piloting this bi-weekly multidisciplinary review. So those concise reports, one of the problems we started to see that they were really, they were um, written from a single source, uh, a single, uh, one radiotherapist's point of view. And we think we have an opportunity to learn more if we get the opinion of an oncologist and a physicist as well, and another radiotherapist. So we piloted this bi-weekly multidisciplinary review. Uh, we're starting to wonder if we're doing the right thing. We're two months into a three-month pilot. And I think the people that are involved in the uh, discussions are learning a lot, uh, but we're not sure if we're doing a good job of disseminating that knowledge in the program. So um, next time I give rounds, maybe we'll talk about uh, whether the bi-weekly multidisciplinary review is getting us anywhere. And we also, on that slide, we do some external reporting, and we track recommendations. External reporting is about to undergo a change because of the CPQR, so there's going to be a national system for uh, incident reporting, 
And the whoever, I don't, we don't know how we're going to use this. It's uh, in beta version uh, come the fall, they say. It's based on Kai High's medical error reporting system. But we'll be able to, we have six categories for errors. So you put in a text description, and then we can pick 33 drop down fields from these six categories to categorize the incidents. Um, so it was unveiled. Uh, the reason, you know, there's no national system in Canada. Uh, a Kai High, or sorry, CPQ on their website makes these points. They say the lack of a national registry allowed serious radiation treatment is to propagate from center to center in the U.S. I, I don't know where that's when that's happened. I think they, they, there are treatment incidents in the U.S. that arise for other reasons than a lack of a national system. Uh, but I do believe that we could identify and mitigate system vulnerabilities across the country. And at the very least, we'll have a common language to talk about incidents, although we might not agree on those terms for a particular incidents. And I guess my view, I'm a little um, uh, suspicious around the whole thing. Each, each cancer center in the country has unique equipment and processes and priorities for those uh, subsystems. And when you do an investigation at home, you really do develop this idea of mindfulness. But our mindfulness in our center is not the same mindfulness at Credit Valley or Barry or Edmonton. They have their own mindfulness that I'm sure serves them very well. Uh, and there might be commonalities, but a lot of these things are really local. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, at the last winter school, the point was brought up by one of the big titans of Canadian incident, medical incident reporting. We, we don't have to sit around and wait for the incidents to happen. We can just go fix stuff. Um, and that's my, part of my love-hate uh, relationship here. So lastly, I want to talk about some work uh, the Quality Committee has been doing and we presented at the Winter School uh, last year. So we uh, I do believe we have good uh, reporting rates, but I want to know if our reporting rate is changing over time. And if, remember, there are reported events and then there are either incidents or near misses. So that those, I want, we wanted to figure out if those events change over time. So uh, over the, these, we look, got, look at in Mosaic and got all the data there of a little over 16,000 courses of radiotherapy. So does anybody want to guess at how many, uh, what either our event rate per thousand courses or how many events a year are we looking at in our reporting system? Hundreds? Well, that looks, so is that 100 or 999? <laughs> you order of magnitude, guys. Okay. Pardon me? One percent. Smart guy. Yeah, you'll get a gold star, Dr. Keller. Um, so just a reminder, um, so all those incidents and near misses add up to the total events. So there are events that happen that go get unreported. Uh, of course, we can't comment on those. Uh, and in this data set, there were no harmful incidents of any clinical se severity. So the rate per thousand is uh, 23. So 16, well, 8,000 a year times 23. So about 170 uh, events in a year. I do my math right um, uh, and, uh, and we'll see how Dr. Keller got it right too on one of these control charts. So um, I love the control charts. Uh, so this shows the variation in this is the number of uh, courses of radio, a uh, number of new starts as recorded in Mosaic for the last two years. So week by week, the dashed line in the middle is the average. Um, so about 150 new starts a week. And the solid lines are the variation we would expect to happen normally. Um, and so uh, this is, I think, one of the challenges for our organization that we have to be ready to deliver between 120 and 180 courses, uh, new starts each week. And we don't know where that's going to be week by week. Um, and so we look for what's called out of control conditions. And I've highlighted some here that if you come up to this monitor are really obvious. But as I look at the screen, they're very hard to see. Um, so this is out of control here. And here, because they're below the lower control limit. Any guesses why we go out of control? Yeah, great. And uh, there's a little out of control signal here and here that happens. After care, after care. <laughs> after care? Oh, okay. I haven't heard that take on it. Yeah, this is uh, sort of Q3. The numbers tend to go up a little bit in two years, two years running. So we want to look at the, so we started with thought, well, let's do this very simply and look at the control chart for the number of, um, uh, incidents that are, uh, and near misses that get uh, reported. And so this is the maths for the control chart here. It's just a simple average week by week uh, with upper and lower control limits that uh, look like uh, Poisson statistics. 
So uh, we set control limits based on the first 25 weeks. So this is the number of incidents per week. So of course you want this number to be low and that's about, uh, so averaging about one incident per week and never more than four. We wouldn't expect, if we had more than four incidents a week, that would be unusually high. That's what the control chart would tell us. So the numbers are very low. If we go to near misses, we should always have more near misses than we have incidents. And near misses are where we can do our most learning. So about two and a half on average and don't expect any more than six, but there are a few weeks where that happens. What the control chart tells us is that we should go look to see what happened that week, because maybe something was unusual. And this is the, the sum and effect of reported events. So we looked at these control charts, and I thought, gee, for all the work I did plotting all that, I didn't really learn nothing. These are, up at the top here, the data is very quantized. I mean, it's either one, two, three, or four. Like, there's, there's not much to learn. And then I thought, well, maybe it's because of that huge variation week to week in the number of patients. So maybe if we um, use what's called a U-chart and look at the proportion of uh, incidents for all the cases that start each week, maybe we'll learn something there. So the maths are a little bit more, uh, a little bit different because now we have to divide by the, for the number of incidents each week divided by the number of cases per week. So we did that, and um, we didn't learn anything more, in fact. So we um, look at the incident rate per week again. Now, because the number of patients per week, the number of new starts per week changes, the control limits change. So if there's fewer patients coming into the building, we have less statistical certainty. So this is the, the Christmas bump here in the, uh, in the um, uh, upper control limit. So the data, again, is all smushed down, and I say Dr. Keller was right on his estimate. The proportion of starts with an incident here is a little less than 1%, um, and a little less than 2% for the near-miss uh, rate per week. So, um, so we have those weekly control limits, but again, we, you know, we're always in control almost, except here, and this is some interesting data on near-misses. So um, I get to look after, from the physics side, uh, the CT scanners. And one of the problems we've had and investigated on the quality committee for a few years is um, the bookings on the CT scanners. And the CT staff were very helpful for that period, for these few weeks, because when the bookings weren't right, they filed an incident report. And over the course of a month, about 160. That's 25% of the work that they do. They have to spend time reworking, very, very costly. So that was the only out of control condition there because we had uh, seven control points above the central line. And that was, and that was, that has been investigated. We haven't fixed the problem, but we're, uh, we're investigating it. So the big, uh, the big thing that we learned on this was the best chart to use is one called a G chart. And the G comes from a geometric distribution, which is uh, ideal for looking at rare events and incidents here, and ideally are rare events. So the chart is going to look a little different. So the C chart and the U charts, we plotted the number or the rate of events versus time. And the G chart is really neat because it actually looks at the time between events. Uh, and then we just count the number of events. So say if you have 10 reported events and one start, uh, there's one after two days and one after six days, we'd be plotting that two day and six day against the sequential number. And uh, the math is, uh, is um, no more sophisticated than any of the other stuff. And then we actually, we do get some out of control conditions. So things start to get interesting. Um, so these can be, so again, we've plotted the incidents, the near misses. Uh, so we see that on average, uh, for incidents here, we expect to go 115 new courses between incidents. And that always makes me think of uh, where I grew up, there was an oil refinery and there is a sign at the front that said, we've got, you know, 68 days without an incident. The guy across the street was a chief engineer. We've gone 69 days without an incident. And when I first saw this, I couldn't help but think, if you're a patient and we've got 100, 112 courses without an incident, I'd wait a week. <laughs> um, so we would expect, if, if anything goes more than 450 courses, then we get these out of control conditions. So why could they go more than 450 courses? Either we're doing a better job and we're not having incidents, or there's been a change in our reporting. I don't know how to tell the difference. But what this, these charts can tell us is there are times when our, this, our whole system performance changes as regard to incidents and near misses. So this is one, this can give us a little bit of insight on that. And of course the interval between new courses is much smaller because there's just lots more of those. So now we, um, as of um, well, a few months ago, we look at the, at the quality committee, which meets every uh, 
thir every third Thursday of the month, we look at the control these control charts now to see if they're um, for these data and other ones to see if we're consistent in the program performance. Uh, those the C charts and U charts were pretty easy to make, but they really didn't tell us very much. But the G chart seems to be the way to go. Uh, and now the, the big challenge is to get a strategy to improve performance. As I get close to the top of the hour, I'm able to finish up with some general comments. So um, we have to incorporate systems and organizational thinkings when we look at quality issues. And I, I you know, this is the, so the second point is the um, uh, kind of the hate part of incident reporting. Uh, I'd much rather that we put more emphasis on designing things safely than waiting for them to fail and then designing them safely. Um, however, reported events, this is the love part. Um, so there was a slide, second to last, with a little bit of love. Um, reported events do provide an opportunity to monitor performance. Um, and interestingly, I think the nice commonality when we look at all the sort of theoretical background and trying to understand incidents that the London Protocol and STAMP show that incidents are really the result of hierarchical systems problems. And so we try to bring that to the incident analysis now in a way we haven't before. Um, overall, I mean, I, I'm very lucky. I only got involved in the quality committee about a year or two ago, and there had been years of work already. So I think we're not seeing anything profoundly new in what we're doing on the quality committee, but it's really built on strong performance for years. So, and I hope we can continue to improve that. Um, there's an opportunity ahead of us starting in the autumn for standardization, I hope, um, with NSERT RT. I think that will be costly for the program, or at least for whoever has to in enter the data, uh, but we can make those decisions later on. Um, the biggest challenge for the quality committee and certainly all around incident analysis is coming up with good recommendations and then making sure they get implemented. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. And I would just emphasize in all that that we have to be proactive about our quality. So if there's any questions I'm with the quality committee or incident reporting, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs>